Hello, how are you doing guys? My name is Davis Abreu. Uh, I represent the New York City International Christian Church. Got baptized November 27, 2009. And um, so why, what I'm doing, why I'm here, I'm here to share you about the truth. I mean, uh, the, the heart behind it and um, my whole goal behind this is to share my faith with many people uh, that um, that I have in Facebook. I have like over a thousand people on Facebook. And a couple of hundreds, at least about a hundred or so, or two hundred are not part of my church or any churches in the movement. So my whole goal is to connect this message to them and, um, and anyone that's inspired by it, amen, this is for you too as well. Also, the heart behind it is to bring those that have fallen away back. For anyone that is thinking about falling away or in that process, hopefully this can stop you from making that mistake as well. And for all those that are worshiping God falsely, because obviously if there's over thousands of different teaching about Jesus Christ, which is only one, over like a many of different churches, obviously they got to be the right one and a whole lot is not the right one. So we got to make sure that we get our our evidence from the scripture. The scripture itself will tell you which is the right one. So the title of this is The Truth Will Set You Free. And we're going to start this off in James chapter 1 verses 22 to 25. It says here, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently to the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is awesome. This is a great introduction about the truth for such a free. Well, pretty much in here it says, you cannot just merely listen to the word, but you got to do what it says. How you listen to the word? By doing this. Hello? Hello? Nah, I'm just joking. You cannot listen to a word like that. The Bible speaks. The Bible is the word. God is the word. So when you read the Bible, it's God speaking to you. How? How that's right? Okay. According to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So we see here that God is the word. So when the Bible speaks, God is speaking. <laughs> you know? So what are God saying here according to the scripture that do not just listen to the word, but do what it says? Why? Because it says here, if anyone listens to the word, but does not do what it says, it's like a man who looks in the face in the mirror, and after looking himself, goes away and forget what he looks like. That's how it is, you know? It's like when you go to the mirror and you wake up in the morning, a long clock goes on, you come to see that you only have an hour to get to work and do everything in an hour. Sometimes what we could do is go to the bathroom, wash our face real quick, brush your teeth, you know, and, and boom, drink coffee and out of the doors. But then when you get to work, everybody's looking at you all weird and stuff, you know, like, hey, what is, like, why are people looking at me? Do I got something in my face? And you look in the mirror, unfortunately, yes, you got something in your face. Two things you have. You have crust coming out of your eyes that you forgot to wash out. And you got a booger hanging in your nose that you forgot also to take out. One thing about getting out of the bathroom, washing your face, brushing your teeth in the morning, you also got to make sure that those, those holes in your nose get, get wiped out too. You understand know what I mean? Because <laughs> when you want the water, you know, it, you know, some of the water, you know, gently goes inside that, you know. So you want to make sure that you're fully complete. So in the Bible too as well, you could do that sometimes. We get... You know, we study the Bible, we look at it, but then we forget what, what we what we have uh, learned. Forget everything. Forget the teachings of Jesus. You know? So you got to hold on to the teachings of Jesus. You cannot just forget. And if you do, and if you do not just forget what you hear, but doing it, it says right here, but verse 25 said, But whoever looks intently to the perfect law that gets freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed for what he do. So you got to continue to look intently to the word of God 
and doing it to be blessed in what you do. You know what I mean? And, okay, uh, a scripture that can refer to this as well is um, John chapter 8, 31, 32. says here to the Jews who have believed him Jesus said if you hold to my teaching you are already my disciples then you know the truth and the truth will set you free wow so you got these Jews they believe in Jesus Christ don't we all believe in Jesus Christ many people believe in Jesus Christ some people is really sincere about the Jesus Christ. Some people is really sensitive about the relationship with God. You can't tell me I'm not a Christian. I've been a Christian all my life. You can't. I know. I read the Bible inside out and all this stuff, right? People say all this stuff, you know. But that's how these Jews feel. They believe in Jesus' teaching just like you. But Jesus said, okay, you know what? If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Okay, Davis, it says here, disciple. It didn't say nothing about Christian. Okay, you know what? I'm glad you asked. Because when we read Acts chapter 11, verses 25, 26, it said the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So for the first time when the, uh, in seven years when the church first started in Acts chapter 2, that the, that the disciples called Christians. People gave the name Christians to the disciples as a, as a derogatory term, as like little Christ. Christians, in other words, means Christ-like. Little Christ, you know? So, it's a bold statement to be, called, to be called a Christian. When you call me Christian, you're pretty much saying that you're just like Jesus Christ. It's a bold statement. So in order to know what it means to be a Christian, you need to study out what it means to be a disciple. So Jesus said right here, okay, if you hold to my teeth, then you're really my disciple. So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to hold to the teachings of Jesus. You know? So the intellectual belief, feeling, fuzzy feelings, my spirit is telling me this, I feel my spirit, all of this stuff that you that you feel, if it does not line up to the teachings of Jesus, then that's not truth. Because the Bible says here, if you hold to my teachings, then you will know the truth. And then you'll be set free. So we have some characters in the Bible that does hold on to the teachings of Jesus, you know. I'm just going to show you one character, not to go too far ahead of, of this. Um, Acts chapter 17, 10 to 12. It says, it says here, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So you got this, the Bereans in the city of Greece, right? Brothers, the, the believers sent Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ in the Silas, away to Berea. So when they went to the Jewish synagogue, they saw these Bereans, and they saw that they're a more noble character than the Thessalonians. Why? Because, oh, by the way, noble just means a good person, an excited person, fired up, humble. It's other forms of noble, you know? So they were more like that than the, the, Th the Thessalonians. Why? Because they received the message of Paul with great eagerness. So they were excited. But. Here's what made them noble. And here's what made them wise. It says here. And examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So they want to make sure. Okay, Paul is an apostle. He's like he's, he's just like Christ. I'm not saying he's Christ. But he's just like him, you know. But it says here, I need to make sure that everything that I'm excited about from the message is in the scriptures. Why? The Bible tells you why. Okay, let's see why. Second Thessalonians. Alright. Let's see why. There you go. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. There you go. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3. It says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Wow. For the day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness, which is Satan, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. So it says here, do not let anyone deceive you in any way. What is anyone? Anyone. Brothers, sisters, people that says I'm a Christian, preachers, anybody. Even me. Make sure that you got your Bibles, you know. Everything I'm sharing with you is from the scriptures, you know. So these Bereans understood that message, you know. So that's why they want to make sure everything with Paul said was true. And guess what? As a result, because of that, as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So, okay, how do you build your faith? How do you come into faith? How? Well, it says here, uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 17. Consequently, faith comes from the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. There you go. So how do you get faith? How do you come to believe? It has to be through the message of Christ, which is the word of God. Now these Bereans have the scrolls because it says they eagerly examined the scriptures to see what Paul said was true. So what Paul was talking about, Jesus Christ, how do we know that? Because they have the scrolls and Jesus' prophecy was already in the scrolls. Jesus himself physically did a, was it in the Old Testament, like physically I'm talking about, not spiritually, you know, physically, right? Just like Moses is a David, that's what I'm talking about, right? So only the prophecies of Jesus was in our Old Testament, right? And Paul is the witness of Jesus. So everything that Paul was preaching to these Bereans lined up with the prophecies that was in the scriptures in the Old Testament. It lined up together. And that what made these Bereans have faith. And as a result, because of that, many of them believed. And also now I'm a prominent Greek woman and many Greek men. So in order to believe, we cannot just accept religious, religious people's saying. It has to make sure it's from the scriptures. And just to get open with you guys as well, that was me at one point in time. Before I became a true disciple, a true Christian, Man, I used to go to church, you know, in uh, Midtown, and then this preacher, that priest, really so great. And, like, he was so great that I just stopped having my Bible. I was like, you know what? Let me just hear this guy. He preaches good. And then you go to the train sometimes, you hear the message. Oh, that's good. So we all believe in the message, you know. And um, and sometimes, you know, if you have your family members that they, they feel like they know the Bible, they feel like they know God, they give you all this stuff, you know. But, they deny it. but like, most of their saying, at least... 90% of everything what they're saying is not even from the scripture. It's based on their own feelings. Okay, show me in the scriptures where that says that. At. Then. But no, it's coming. Oh, look, this is what my spirit is telling me. This is what my heart feels. Make sure it lines up to the Bible so you will not get deceived. So this is the things that I've been through. You know, I don't, want to make, I don't want you guys to make my mistake. Just going by feelings, emotions, and stuff like that, you know. Because uh, cause those Jews, that's what, you know, they believe in Jesus. That's what Jesus said. Okay, if you hold to my teaching, then you read my disciple. So I'm here, I'm here now to refute two types of religion. One of those that are following through Catholics, you know, they believe in infant baptism. And one of those who believe to get right with Christ, you just need to pray a prayer in your heart to be saved. So I'm going to present some evidence to refute that, you know. So, okay, you know, Catholics believe... In order, like, for an infant to be baptized. Infant baptism is a tradition, right? Now, we're going to see here um, how we can refute that in here. We'll take a look in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm sorry, guys. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 to 12 says... In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. 
So we learn here, you can also read in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, that we learn here that baptism is a participation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And how do you contact the blood of Jesus? At baptism, through your faith in his blood. Do a baby has faith? Because it says here about baptism, it's clearly right here, it says here, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God. Your faith. Do babies have faith? Nope. Are babies sinless? No, heck no. They, babies don't even know how to talk yet. They don't know how to distinguish what's good from evil. Babies don't have faith. They only know what they see. The only thing they have faith in is their milk <laughs> and, their, and, and their food, you know. So why do you baptize babies? Okay, you know what? I'm going to tell you why we baptize babies, you know. Constantine, you know, and present this, this um, inheriting sins, you know, from the generations to generations, you know. So babies inherit the parents' sin. Really? Okay, you know what? Let's see what, let's see what the Bible has to say about that. I'm going to take a look at Ezekiel. Chapter 18, verses 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 20. It says, The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent. Nor would the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. What do we learn here? That that you're, that everyone is responsible for their own actions. So the child here will not share the guilt of their parents if they sin. Nor would the parent share the guilt of the child. Boom. There you go. We just refuted it false doctrine right here so in the result is Catholic is the true religion that we need to follow but well, their tradition is baptizing babies oh then we just okay you know what? how do Jesus feel about tradition that contradicts the Word of God here oh well, well, let's take a look at the scriptures right here in um, Matthew chapter 15 let me see if I can get another one. Let me see this one here, Mark chapter 7 3. Alright, I'm gonna take a um take a look at a new one, right? Check this out. Mark chapter 7, verses 1. It says, The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, defiled. That is unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with the foul hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, <clears throat> as it was written. <clears throat> These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules in other words rules taught by men you have let go of the commands of god and holding on to human tradition and he continues you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of god in order to observe your own tradition for moses said honor your father and mother anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death but he said if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is corbin that is, devoted to God, then you no longer 
let them do anything to their father or mother. Thus you notify the word of God for the sake of your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone. Understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of the person that defiles them. After he said, after he, after he had left, the crowd entered the house and his disciples asked about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. You don't understand nothing that uh, you don't understand that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them, for it does not go into the hearts but into their stomach, and that out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all food clean. He went on. What comes? He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts comes. Sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, uh, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evil comes from the inside and defiles a person. So we see about tradition here, right? So that same way that the elders had tradition that they held, the Catholic people, they keep the tradition of baptizing babies. This right here, you know to find the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And the Bible right here is calling you guys hypocrites. So my encouragement for you to really follow the message of, the, of Jesus according to the scripture, not by tradition, you know. So right, it's one of the thing, things that you need to repent from. And uh, I encourage you to come talk to me, message me if you want to learn more about that. Now, another second, um, you can say a tradition. A false, uh, a false doctrine that I have to rebuke, I mean refute here, is praying Jesus into your heart. You know, um, saying to yourself that I receive salvation by praying a prayer, believing with all of my heart. That's how I receive the Spirit of God and the, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, you know what? Where do they get this from? Okay, let's take a look at here. Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10, verses, okay, verses 9. It says here, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess with your faith and are saved. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Really? That's it? That's how you get right with God. Okay, here's the thing I got to refute here. We have this thing called context that we need to study in context. Now, if we look at chapter Romans chapter 1, verse 7, who is this scripture is referring to? Who is the book of Romans is referring to? And Paul wrote Romans. Verse 7 says, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans is, is referring to God's people, people that are saved, people that are already disciples, are already Christians, you know, and according to Acts chapter 2. So when you see here, this context right here is referring to Israelites' unbelief because these guys were falling away from, from God. These guys were starting to shrink their faith and, and not holding to the teachings of Jesus to be a disciple of Jesus. So this is not the way how to get right with Christ. This is just a way to stay right with Christ. So in order to stay right with Christ, you got to keep on proclaim that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. To be safe, you know what I mean? To stay safe. Now, it says here, yeah, okay, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, Lord, Lord, is that it? Okay, when do you call on the name of the Lord? When? Let's see right here in Acts chapter 22, 16. 
It says here, Acts chapter 2, 22, verse 16. This is Paul's sermon, his testimony about how everything happened, how he how he persecuted Christians, and uh, how Jesus came to them, blinded him for three days. Ananias healed Paul's blind blindness, you know. And this is what Ananias told Paul in verse 16. It says, And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So when do we call on the name of the Lord? At baptism. And then once you get baptized, you got to keep on renouncing that Jesus is Lord in your life to stay saved. And that's what the Israelites were not doing. That's where the belief was lacking. And another form of, uh, of, of something that I had to refute here is, okay, baptism is a symbol. Yeah, you know, many of you say baptism is a symbol. One time I called this church that uh, my brother's in just to get some evidence. I've been there, but I just want to get some evidence. And this is woman told me that, um, okay, you know what? In order to be saved, you need to pray with all of your heart. With all your heart, you have to pray. And that's how you get the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And baptism is just a symbol, really. Those are the exact words. Unfortunately, those words is not in the Bible. In other words, um, you, this is what the Bible says you should not do. In Revelations, in Revelations chapter 22, verses 18 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, that will add to that person the place described in the scrolls. And if anyone takes words away from the scrolls of the prophecy, God will take away that person any shares in the tree of life and the holy city which is described in the scroll. And you got and we have other ones too as well in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 6. I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 6, 30, verses 6. Verse 6. Oh, I missed sound. <laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> sorry, guys. Okay, and go to Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. Verses six. There you go. Proverbs verse thirty, verse six. Sorry for the for the delay. It says, "Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you are a liar." <laughs> wow. So pretty much what that woman that told me about this add to the words, and many people today are adding to the God, God's words. So, okay, I'm gonna, so since I share you with this, we're going to see two things, how to refute that. I'm going to show you another scripture right here. This is how you get right with Christ. Acts chapter 2, verses 38. In the context of this is the day of the Pentecost. When, uh, when all Israel from all nations came together with the, at the feast of the, the first fruit. And when Peter received the keys to the kingdom of heaven... And um, Matthew chapter 16, 13 to 19, that Jesus is going to use Peter to start his church. This is how he started it, you know. And it says, and it says here, like uh, we read before Acts, Acts 2, 38, Peter is preaching about Jesus' crucifixion. And um, it says, verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be sure of this, God had made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, in other words, Christ. When people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off. For all who the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them 
and pleaded to them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. How do you get right with God? How do you get the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit? Prayer, prayer? No. That's not, that's not what it says in here. You read Romans. Obviously, Acts, Acts comes before Romans, am I right? So Romans don't come after Acts. It's Acts, you know? And we see here that you have to repent. First, you have to have faith in Christ. But Peter preaches Jesus' crucifixion about to all the Jews, right? So once they believe in Christ, they accepted his message, you know. And um, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he that died for all our sin, and he had resurrection on the third day. And then here, once you believe in that, you got to repent. Turn away from your, from your sins. 180 degrees turn. And then be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you gain your salvation by any other different teachings, your salvation is in vain and you and worship me God falsely. So this is my encouragement to you is to turn from that, get yourself right with God and come to me, you know, and I will help you as much as I can. This is what I'm here to inspire you, to serve you with the right information. And when we read further here, it says, the promise is for you, I mean for these people and up from the Israelites at this first century, and for their children, and for all who are far off, that's us today, in this generation. And Peter right here, it says here, verse 40, with many other words they warned them. So do you know what? They don't just say that. They gave them many, uh, they warned them with many other words to get right with God. So this says, so, so Peter says, save yourself from this corrupt generation. So how do you be saved? By doing what exactly what Peter said, repent and be baptized. So it says here, verse 41, those who, those who accepted his message, okay, did they get baptized yet? Okay, you got people that accepted his message, said those who accepted his message, right? So people accepted the message of Jesus Christ. Are they saved yet? Nope. It says, for those who accepted were baptized, and about 3,000 added to number that day. There you go. So those who accepted the message of Jesus Christ, that they have faith in Jesus Christ, they repented from their sins, then they got baptized, now they're added to the kingdom of God, they're saved, you know? But you're still having this baptism is a symbol stuff, right? So I'm going to show you how you're wrong with that. Let's take a look at uh, Peter to refute that false doctrine. Hmm. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, Peter chapter 1, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20, it says, To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark were being built, in it only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water and this water which is the flood water symbolizes baptism wait 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 symbolizes baptism wait you mean to tell me baptism is not the symbol no nope, that's not what my scripture said here the water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also not the removal of dirt from the body but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God it saved you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What we learn in here, see the days of Noah when the ark was being built, when that flood came, the whole world was being led astray with in sin, in Satan, you know? And only eight people was right out of the whole world. Eight people was right. Think about it today. It's eight billion people in this world. How many are really truly saved? If eight people were saved, out of maybe the word of a million approximately at the days of Noah then you get a, a clear idea that not everyone who says that Jesus is Lord will be saved or right with God now we see here that the water of the flood symbolizes baptism that day the water washed away all this in other words it killed hundreds of thousands of people approximately and only eight people were saved 
So what symbolizes today and it's what represents that spiritually? When, when we get baptized through faith in the power of God with a clear conscience, according to the scripture right here, then all your sins that represent the physical sins of those people that, that got killed and end up with the flood in the days of Noah, that all dies. So your sin gets killed. It gets washed away. And then that's when you'll be saved, you know? But you need to have a clear conscience. So if you don't believe in Christ or this or and but you can't get baptized, or you say you just say you believe in Christ, but you don't know you don't know about you don't know much about the Bible. You believe in Christ with all your heart, but you don't have any knowledge of the Bible, you don't know what repent means. But then people tell you, yeah, you can get baptized. You have faith in Christ. God has done a lot of miracles for you. You ready. Then you get baptized, but your mind's not clear. You don't have a clear conscience because you don't have any knowledge of the Bible yet. You need to study out the Bible. You need to study out okay what it takes to really be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You need to count the cost. There is a cost. So if you get a teaching that's different than here, that's false. So is there a cost to follow Christ? There is a cost. Let's see what that cost is. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 verses 25 to 33 it says large crowds travel with travel large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them and said if anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother wife and children brothers and sister yes even their own life such person cannot be my disciple and whoever and whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple suppose one of you wants to build a tower won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone will seize it, ridicule you. Saying, this person began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose the king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against them with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the others is still a long way off and will ask to turn of peace. In the same way, those who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Notice that three times Jesus said, if you cannot do this, you cannot be my disciples. Now we see here, according to verse, um, who is the scripture referring to? Anyone. What anyone means? Anyone. It says in 28, suppose you want to build a tower. Why don't you first down and sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? So this, what does the tower represent? That's you. You are that tower. Do you have enough money to complete it spiritually, so to speak? Do you have enough what it takes to be a disciple, to be a Christian? Because the word Christian is a bold statement. When you say you're a Christian... You're proclaiming to be just like Christ. Because Christian means Christ-like, little Christ. So you say you're just like Jesus Christ. A disciple is a student of Jesus. Someone that learns from... I'm a disciple. I'm a student. And um, I'm making every effort to be a Christian here. I'm not going to say I'm like Jesus Christ. I'm making every effort to be like Him. I'm trying. And I just got to just keep on persevering. And... Um, I mean, honest, I had to give up a lot of things in order to be a disciple, you know? You know I was a slave to impurity, you know? Um, and uh, I have seen a lot of deception. I, was, I lied a lot. I used to steal a lot, you know? I've done a lot of things, you know? And um, for me, in order to be a Christian, I had to give that up in order, for me, in order to follow Christ. It wasn't easy because most of my life I was a slave to it, you know? Like 15 years of my life I was a slave to sin for the first time I'm learning something that I'm not used to it's not easy but that's the course that you want to take you have to give up your false doctrine you have to give up <coughs> sexual immorality impurity <coughs> the lies the deceit the lack of knowledge you have to be willing to give all that up to follow Christ you have to be willing to put your family last put Jesus first that's why it says here too. Um, 
I want to give you a better scripture too to, to back up that scene in verses um in verse 26 in Matthew chapter 10 Matthew 10 verses 38 it says here okay I'm sorry Matthew chapter 10 verses 37 it says anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me anyone who loves their son or daughters more than me is not worthy of me whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me therefore if you love your family more than Jesus Christ if you put them above God you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ and that was interesting here in verse 30 and verse 20 and 31 it says or oh, suppose of a king is about to go to war against another king Will you not sit down and estimate whether he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he has sent a delegation while the other is still a long way off and acts with terms of peace. So who is the 10,000? You. Who is the 20,000? Jesus. God himself. You know? You cannot go against God. It's just like a physical king. If, if, uh, if a king with 20,000 go on war with a king with 10,000, they have to surrender or else they're all going to die. And when I say they surrender, everything, all the possession belongs now to the king of 20,000. Same thing with Jesus. If you want to follow Christ, you need to count the cost. Do you have enough to complete it? Are you willing to put Jesus first in your family? Are you willing to put your time in God's time rather than time with your job, rather than God with your job time or family time? You have to give up a lot in order to follow Christ. If you want to learn more about that, you could just message me as well, you know. And verse 33, I mean, verse 27, if he does not, whoever does not carry the cross cannot be my disciple. You know that cross? What it symbolizes? Death. Who died on the cross? Jesus Christ. Are you willing to die to your sins every single day to suffer for Jesus Christ? Every single day, you gotta remind yourself what you have, what what you, what Jesus did for you. Are you willing to be reminded that you know what your sins killed Jesus? Every single day when you wake up, when you get out of there, you're carrying that cross. You're making, you have to repent from lust, sexual morality, anything that goes in your mind that is a sin. You have to carry that cross because that is exactly why Jesus died. And you gotta also deny yourself. Luke chapter nine, verses twenty-three. You gotta deny yourself to it as well. You know what? My flesh is telling me I want to look at that, that girl. You know what? You got to better deny yourself. You know? My flesh is telling me I want to stay home. I don't want to go to church. You got to deny yourself, you know? Jesus denied himself in the garden of Gethsemane. He had to pray three times to get his heart right with God in order to go through this death. So do you deny yourself every single day? Do you count the cost every, sing every single day? Because every day is a continuation count. Now, if you fall short on counting the cost, guess what? You can recount the cost again and get yourself right. For those that have fallen away and you have fallen away, I encourage you to repent and get back up. Because there is no other way but this way. All right, Davis. Okay, you know what? I get what you're saying. But, man, you know that, that pastor they showed on YouTube? Man, he was, this guy, you know, he, he killed demons. He was, he was casting out demons. <coughs> I saw him do miracles, you know? Really? Okay, you know what? According to the, the according to Luke chapter nine, verses one. Luke nine verses one. It says, "When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, and to cure diseases, and sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God to heal the sick." There you go. Jesus gave the authority to the apostles to cure diseases, to cure demons, and heal them. Which means the authority in order to do such thing has to come with Christ. Also, the apostles. Okay, let's see the scripture about that. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Verses, verses are 1. To six, it says here, in those days when the numbers of disciples were increasing, the he the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the the Hebraic 
Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in a daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It will not be right to, for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in, our, in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and they will give our attention. I'm sorry. And we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They choose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Also Philip and um, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timor, Paramarius, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostle who prayed and laid their hands on them. So we see here that the apostle gave those seven men authority to put the responsibility on them to do the same thing that Jesus gave authority to the apostles to do. And the apostles was just focusing now on prayer and the ministry of the word. So how we know that? Okay, you know what? Well, take a look at the evidence in James and Acts chapter 8. It says here that Philip, he's a Samaritan, right? And um, Simon the sorcerer, he's someone that was that was a sorcery, practiced witchcraft, right? We have here that Philip, the Philip, the one with the chosen the seven, that the apostle uh, um, he uh, he raised up to to uh, to go out to do what he did. You know, he baptized his son the sorcerer and many other disciples. He did miraculous signs and healings. You know, but it says here, verses eighteen. When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the lane on the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability that everyone who I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, all the miraculous gifts and everything that goes with it, you know? But notice that Philip baptizes Simon <clears throat> and the others. <coughs> but they did not receive the Holy Spirit and the miraculous gifts. They had they Philip did that he did miraculous gifts he healed people in Samaria but he couldn't pass them on why because it had to be authorized by Jesus Christ so Jesus Christ did not authorize these these chosen of the seven to to pass on the gifts no Jesus authorized the apostles right so Jesus already died you know so the apostles gave the responsibility of the six to have those gifts but these people the chosen of the seven did not get the authority to pass on the gifts what that means that means in order for anybody that says I'm, that that's a, a pastor today or anybody that you witness or see that they are casting out demons or they knocking people down with their prayers and all this stuff it's unfortunate what we see here this is not biblical those are not demons they're casting from God. That's just from the devil itself. That's decept That's deception right there. How we know it's deception? Okay, because we see that in order to get the, the gifts of God to do that, it has to be authorized by Jesus or the apostle himself, you know. And unfortunately, Jesus died. The apostle died. Those that the apostle passed on the gift, they died. So there's no more passing, right? So let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians here. We're almost about to close out right now. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 9 says, The coming of the Lordless One will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders to serve the lie. Wow. So we see here that Satan used all sorts of displays of power and signs and wonders. But his, but uh, but the purpose of him is to deceive people about the truth. Verse ten it says, and all the ways that the wicked the wickedness deceive those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth. So be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion, so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned 
and who have not believed in the truth, but, del but delighted in wickedness. So this means here that Satan does miracles just like Jesus Christ. It's like God. But his miracle, his signs, deceive people about the truth. So, so it's like a, another version, the 84 version, is, is counterfeit. So you know like a counterfeit dollar bill? It looks real, but there's no line in the middle. That's how Satan is. He gives you this much truth, so you may believe in the lie, but this little bit, that's where he leaves off. But you only see the big thing, not the small thing, you know? So, okay, Davis, so tell me, tell me where this says in the Bible that prophets, that people that are pastors, people, these prophets, tell me where it says that those people can, that does not cast out demons. Show me in the Bible, then I believe. Okay, you know what? Revelation chapter 19, verses 20. Let's see what Revelation 19, 20 says. Revelation 19, verses 20 says, But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet. There you go. The false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With the signs, those miracles, remember the signs like casting out demons, you know, healing people, all this stuff in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out. Those stuff that you see in YouTube and all that stuff, right? With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. In other words, those that worship Satan and his lies that has his image, spiritually so to speak. The two of them, Satan and those people that worship Satan, <laughs> were thrown alive into the fairy lake of burning sulfur. This is what will happen. So we see here that false prophets today can't do the same thing that Jesus did. So you see stuff on YouTube about, about these false prophets, about pastors casting out demons and stuff like that, you know, mainly in church. Pastors knocking people down with their prayer or like, oh, oh mm, mm, all, this, all this stuff right here. According to the scripture that we learn here today, that is false doctrine. That is coming from Satan itself. Because it's not coming from Christ or the apostles. They, are not get, they did not receive these gifts from Jesus or the apostles. They received these gifts from Satan himself. It's easy. That's why everything I'm sharing with you today, that, if you, that the way you become a Christian by praying Jesus into your heart, or, or praying this prayer with all your heart, that's how you receive the Holy Spirit and get baptized as a symbol. And then all of a sudden you pray in the tongues, you're doing all this stuff right here, you feel you're right with God. Unfortunately, the way I share you through the scripture, that is the wrong way to become a Christian. And, and this is what you see here. Everything is wrong. That's why you have to study in context. So this topic, the title of this message is The Truth Will Set You Free. I give you evidence. Not one time that I gave you my own personal words or the way I feel. Everything I have given you is from evidence from the scriptures itself. So this is what happened if you refuse to listen to the truth. So be saved. According to 2 Thessalonians. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21. And this is a closing scripture right here. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drives out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So we see here that Jesus said, Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, went to the kingdom of heaven. This is taking place in the day of judgment day. Who's not everyone? Not everyone. So right now we have about 8 billion people in this world today. Probably like a billion people believe that they are Christians. But Jesus said not anyone that calls himself a Christian is going to heaven. Only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's why I show you James chapter 1 verses 22 to 25 and John chapter 8, 31 32 to start it off. That you need to hold to the teachings of Jesus. That you need to continuing, continuously do what the word says. So that you, so that the scripture says here. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy? I mean, I'm sorry. It says here, not everyone who said to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So you need to do the will of God. 
the will of God. And where we get the will of God from? From the scriptures. You need to make sure that everything you do lines up with the scriptures, with the word of God. That your will is not coming from a fuzzy feeling in your heart. Your will is not coming from this, from what you feel, from this, what your spirit think is telling you. It has to come from the word of God. You have to make sure your, what you're feeling lines up with this truth, with the scriptures. And anybody that is a true Christian that got baptized, that are finding Christ this way, got the true Holy Spirit. And God, and God can lead you to the truth, you know. So everything I'm showing you is from the scriptures. And what happened is in here, verse 22, many people will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drives out demons to perform many miracles. Lord, did we not pray up to you? Did we not go to church every single week? Lord, did we not share our faith? Lord, did we not cast out demons? I Lord, did we not see in YouTube this pastor that was casting out demons in your name? You know, Lord, did we not do that even? I heal people with your name, Lord. Now we know about false doctrine here. But Jesus says in, your, in verse 23, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. So if you refuse to know the truth, if you refuse to love the truth, if you don't want to accept this message, verse 23, this is what Jesus will say. Then I'll tell them plain, I never knew away from me, you evil doers. My hope, my goal is for you guys that are either looking to fall away, we can't fall away. I encourage you not to fall away because this is what you're going to end up doing if you choose to fall away. It says here in Matthew chapter 12, verses 30 Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, e either in this age, which is the first century, or the age to come, which is our age. If you're looking to fall away, you're pretty much saying, okay, the Spirit of God is no longer in this church. I don't feel convicted. I don't feel present in this church, you know. I can't be here. So pretty much what you do, you deny the Spirit of God. You deny the Church of God, the body of Christ. And you're pretty much scattering God and His church. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me, see the disciples gather with Jesus. So if you're not gathering with Jesus, you're scattering. So my encouragement to you is to come back. So in closing here... If you're not a disciple, if you're not a Christian, if you're someone that's having a hard time to come to church, if you don't go to church at all, if many people share their faith with you, but you just refuse to like to give in, if you see the results, the outcome of this, my encouragement to you is to come out. Come out. And um, if you want to know more about our church, you can, um, you can go to www nycicc.org we have family churches 39 congregation approximately and we're looking to get more our whole goal is Matthew 28 then Jesus came to him and said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age the whole goal the whole vision is world evangelism we need to make disciples of all nations not just one one town not just making disciples in one neighborhood you know with one congregation one church you know all black church all white church all Spanish no all nations this is what we're looking to do so we are a church a movement a church around the world that we have the same vision as Jesus Christ as to make disciples and when we make a disciple once you become a disciple then you get baptized. And once you get baptized, we're here to hold you account, to teach you how to obey the word of God. And we need to be humble with that, you know. And I am grateful for that because I never had that before I was a Christian. I was in the church. I didn't have accountability partners. I had done a lot of sin because I had nobody to share with me, to be in my life. And that's what we have. Every single one of us in the world, we have partners. We have spiritual mentors that hold each other account to get people to Christ. And that's what we're looking to do. And that's what we do with you. If you have any questions, you can message me on Facebook. And um, if you're not from New York City, um, 
I could recommend you to a church nearby that will teach you about the truth. Everything I've shared with you is from, is from the scripture and this is the same thing you will get. And we have to love one another the way Jesus loved. John chapter 13, 34, 35. Now part of the love, loving one another, is telling people the truth. Guys, I love you a lot. And um, to God be the glory. Forever, ever. Amen. The truth will set you free. Take care.